This is the K95.3 Sports Show Podcast, brought to you by The Fan Zone in Wilmer's Candy Mall. Welcome to the K95.3 Sports Show Podcast. My name is Bo Stanfis. Thank you for tuning in this week. As usual, if you hit the subscribe button for us new for the new people listening, hit the subscribe button if you like what you hear. Next to it, you'll see a bell. If you hit that, that'll give you a push notification on your cell phone when the weekly episodes come out on Wednesday to kind of give you an update of when it air. Kind of a rundown of the show. We're going to talk about the Vikings' uh, embarrassing loss to the Bills on Sunday for a little bit, and then we're going to also touch on the Timberwolves and uh, what's been going on there for the last week. Uh, with signee, with extensions, and trade requests. Uh, Then I'll be finishing the program. I sat down with uh, Ryan and Mark, the Stingers owners, the Wilmer Stingers owners, and talked to them about the review on the season and look forward to their 10th season next year of Stingers baseball. So that's kind of uh, what we got on the gauntlet. So I guess we can, st- oh, I'm sorry, so to in- introduce who I got in here. Um, since we're doing a little shorter um, because of the stingers, I, I just brought in uh, Jeremy Goulet, our office manager. How are you doing, Jeremy? Pretty good. Yourself, sir? Uh, I'm doing what I can do, I guess, after uh, what happened over the weekend with the Vikes. So, <laughs> you know, let's, uh, unfortunately, let's delve into that. I just, I I tried to think of what I wanted to say, how I wanted to, how I wanted to say it. I'm going to try to go glass half full as much as possible during this time Um, because, I mean, anybody can pick on what they did horribly yesterday. Well, we were talking about earlier this morning, (laughs) the only bright spot I saw yesterday was a 70-yard punt. I mean, (laughs) that's what we can take from it. Uh, It's rough, but it's one of those things, too. We can't really – it's the third week. Yes, there were mistakes that probably shouldn't be made in the third week. I mean, we should have, you know, be moving forward better than that. But at the same time, you know, it's as you've said before, too, it, it's better to see a loss like that in week three than in week 16. You know, I mean, so. Yeah, it's, uh, no, no, I, yeah, I, I agree. It's, you can have early season losses and recover from them. It's those late season ones that really kind of put you on your access and just kind of really screw with you. Well, it kind of makes you question where you're, like, where did our team go? Yeah. Whereas I think that was not this last year, but that was two years ago, wasn't it? The Patriots started out just horrible, and mm, yep. they won the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. I Brady mean, was – Brady. everybody was saying Brady was done. Yeah, and he's just like – you know, and I remember everybody was just like, pump the brakes, yep. just relax. It's a season. It's yeah. a long season. So let's get into uh, – I'm going to start off with a quick positive of the Viking game. Okay. Treadwell, four targets – Four receptions, yep. no drops. See, yep. look at that. Just yep. one week. Look how it can change. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I will. I, I, you know, even as a professional athlete, and people say, you know, they're supposed to be paid and they're supposed to make those catches. It's still a mental game. I it's mean, a step and, forward, and that's just it. I mean, I could. I don't think I could come back after a game like I had in Green Bay, like he had, and try to get out of your own head you yep. know i mean it just you'd be so scared oh god don't drop the ball don't drop the ball don't you know don't fumble don't right. so i mean i i i thought that was yeah that was kudos to him yeah no it's uh so yeah so there there we got the positive probably well other than that punt that <laughs> that nice bounce <laughs> the only bounce that went our way yeah on exactly. sunday yeah it's just i just don't know where to start i you know obviously uh the offensive line was just horrible quickly pulling up on my phone i found something on Twitter that talked about it. Um, let's see. The Pro Football Focus Vikings O line surrendered 29 pressures, two sacks, three hits, 24 hurries. Uh, the most of any team in week three. Reef was, was responsible for 12 pressures, which is weird because he's our strongest. Yeah. That's, that's that once again, that just shows when your best offensive lineman's having an off game, then maybe it's just an off game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Remmers with eight. Kirk Cousins was pressured on 53.3% of his dropbacks. <laughs> um, obviously, obviously, we can't have that continue to happen. And, you know, it's just, for some reason, it's just the whole team was just off. Yeah. It, you, you hope most weeks, you know, the special teams is off like last week uh, against the Packers. You hope that just one part of your, of, of your team is off, if they are off, and that the others can pick them up. But when the entire team is off, you're just – you're just SOL. Well, and, you know, I hate to bring up bad memories, but it reminds me a lot of uh, 
this Sunday, it, it was a complete flashback to the NFC Championship game. Yeah, I it mean, was. It was literally 10 minutes into the game, and, and I'm looking like – Everybody's looking at the scoreboard like, what? what is going on? And plus, I'm sorry, but when when the fans are taken out of it that early, I mean, did you see people were like sleeping? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they were showing later on. I'm surprised they naps stayed. And stuff. I'm surprised they stayed. So, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's it's tough. But like you said, it's one of those things um, that it, 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 if everybody has an off game, everybody has an off game. And, you know, you uh, an interesting stat I was going to remember to bring up to you I saw earlier today that this is the uh, – to. Uh, that the Vikings lost this weekend was the first time that a team uh, has had this sort of a blowout. I think they were favored by 16.9 yep. points, something like that, since 1992. And do you know who the team was that had it happen to them in 1992? Mm-mm. The Buffalo Bills. Oh. <laughs> they beat, were beat by the Jets. And if oh. I remember correctly, in 92, that was, the that Bills was went the, to the Super yeah, Bowl. Yeah, that was one of their Super so, Bowls. So, I mean, you know. See, there you I go. Mean, just, just little things like that. I mean, and half, glass exactly, half full. That's exactly. what I'm talking about. And that's – and. And yeah, it's you know it's it's like a, any kind of a heavyweight fight. It was a fight, and what happens is when you're the small guy and you're going up against a bigger guy. Bill's a small guy. We're the bigger guy. Hopefully, mm-hmm. um, they come in and they if you get a few first punches to kind of get the him. big guy, stun them, and kind of have them fall back on their heels, it'll change it. It'll change the entire fight outcome, and that's what happened. We came out there cocky, like we were going to run them up, and these and the Bills came up and jabbed us a couple of times in the face, and it ended up with an uppercut. And we were just like, we were on the on the ba- on our heels the rest of the game, and, and there was nothing we could do, unfortunately. Right. And you know, I will say though, I thought that uh, uh, you'll notice uh, that's the score of that game. You know, it was twenty-seven nothing at halftime. Yeah. They never did score another point. After, yeah. Yes. So I mean, they we tighten it back up a little bit. I mean, the, the defense still, but I mean, a lot of times in games like that, when they start to get blown out that much, everybody just completely, you know, I that uh, to me, I thought that after half of that game that they were going to put up at least thirty eight to forty on us. I oh, mean, I just yeah, yeah they I mean, the way they it either started. they either they might have laid off the gas a little bit and played smart and played a little smarter, but we stopped them also. Yep. You know, the defense at, uh, overall didn't give up a lot of drives. That first one, which of course had the roughing the passer penalty that led to the seven points. But then when you, when the offense gives the, gives the ball to the other team inside their own 30, it's, it's almost guaranteed points barring a missed field goal or a turnover. Yep. So, so yeah, the, the defense, they had some problems, but I wouldn't say it was all on them. If you want to give a group uh, a higher gra- the highest grade, they would probably get the highest grade. Yep. So, yeah, so let's – I'm uh, trying to think of what else I really want to say about it because I don't want to dwell on it too long because, like I said, it's week three. Well, and another uh, positive side of that too is, you know, I, I feel bad for Kirk Cousins because his stat yeah. line nowhere near reflects what kind of game he had or, yeah. or how he played. You know, he, he didn't have 15, com- um, uh, 15 uh, dropped – or 15 – in completions, he was forty yeah, for fifty-five. And, I mean, and you know, we had a couple of those situations again too, where he was throwing balls and receivers just they weren't mentally, yeah, feeling, you know, securing the ball. Feeling dropped and, yeah. one, and, and he did over he did overthrow a couple of guys. And there were a Cousins couple, but I mean, he, he still didn't look nearly as bad. I mean, when everybody's like, oh, you know, he he fumbled, fumbled twice, it was like, okay, well, he was stripped twice because yeah. he, people got through the O line, and it was on his blind side. Yeah. So I mean. You kind of have to once again talk about the bounces. Yeah, I mean it's just next time he get that happens, it boun- maybe it bounces up into a Vikings player. Exactly. We recover and yep. no no big deal. No big but deal. every bounce except for that punt win against us, um, against us that game. So it's like, yeah, like I said, I'm I'm gonna try to just put it behind us. Um, now, unfortunately, we have to look at stealing a game on one of the tough matchups. You know, either against the Rams this Thursday, the Eagles at Eagles or at Patriots. Those were three games that I had as losses at the beginning of the season. Now, for us to kind of push off the Bills, we need to win one of those three games to kind of even it out. Now, yeah. Um, and after New England lost to the Lions, who well, knows what's going to happen there too? Right. Just shows what a weird, what a weird weekend. It was Lions a super weird. Weekend. Kill the Patriots, and then uh, Packers get. Get their get pretty handled by the Redskins, you know. So it's yeah, they were playing from behind the whole game. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, it's it, inc- basically basically the Browns won on Thursday, and it just screwed everything. I, up. I, I laughed about because <laughs> that's what I was thinking. I'm like, oh man, now it's just going to kind of twist the whole thing here. But yeah, it you know it, and I honestly no, I don't. I mean, I don't know if you got a chance to watch a lot yesterday, but I I caught some of the uh, the Rams and Chargers game, and I'm not going to lie. Yeah, the Rams they <laughs> they look like the real deal. They're you know they're good. Um, 
I still think that they're beatable. Oh, I definitely. mean, it can happen. Um, and I, you know, I'm not nearly as worried now about Philly as I was at the beginning of the season. Me neither. They, they just or the Patriots and, and the Patriots also. So you know, I mean, I think that the landscape is it, it, it's changing. That, Dolphin, that Dolphins game in December is looking crazy, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's uh, it's yeah, it's it's going to begin. So I'll, let, we'll touch just base on the ro- the Chargers a little bit because obviously this podcast comes out Wednesday and and 36 hours later. We're playing the game, so this is going to be a little outdated. So I'm just going to – Well, the, you're talking about the Rams, right? Yeah, the Rams. Okay, what okay. did I say? You said Chargers. Oh, so that threw oh. me for a loop. I'm like, well, we're yeah, talking about no, the Rams now? Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Anyways, the good catch. So, yeah, so for the Rams game, um, good news for the Vikings uh, is the injury report. Uh, both Marcus Peters um, out two to four weeks with oh. calf injury, and Talib was walking on crutches. So – I mean, when you sprain an ankle on a Sunday and you try to play the next Sunday, that's difficult. That can be, let alone that Thursday. So I'm I'm expecting both of those guys to be out, and that will only help us. Yep. Um, that's the thing. Injuries are you know, you can say, oh well, if we win, they're like, oh well, they're injured. Well, that happens. That's the NFL. That's how it Gar- works. Garoppolo, I mean, we faced a, we faced a healthy 49er team. Now everybody else is going to face a Garoppolo's. The 49er team. Well, that's not fair. Well, you know, injuries happen. That's the way it is. We that's don't get to choose who we play when we play. <laughs> no. Him. no. So uh, you know that's, I think that's all I'm going to talk about for Vikings. I just, just one really quick question: Have you sure. heard anything about? Uh, do you know if Delvin Cook is active for um, Thursday? I, at this I did point? see. I did see on Twitter earlier that he is. Um, uh, he's going to try to play. Okay. It sounds like he's going to try to play. He said he feels good, and that it's it seems pretty positive that he will. Okay. So well, and I know that I I had heard somewhere that. Uh, that that was some kind of maybe a coaching decision that they thought against the Bills, a yeah, team that I, there was less, they might have sat him just to get him the rest. So I, I was just curious about that. Yeah, so it sounds like he 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 a very good chance for him to play. Uh, so yeah, I, we'll be we'll be done with the Vikings. Let's move on to yep. a little bit of Timberwolves. Their first uh, their first time making it onto the sports show because obviously we've been. 100% Vikings yep. <laughs> since we've started. Um, so, obviously, uh, we'll wait on Butler. Big news. Carl Anthony Towns, Towns, cat, signs the five-year, $190 million extension. This guy is going to be an animal, just the older and older. I mean, he's an animal now. And as he continues to get better and older and more mature and understand the game and what it takes, he's just, I mean, if he's not going to be, if he's not a top five player at some point in the next five years, I'll be amazed. Yeah, I think he, like you said, it's just it's all about the development. And as they learn the game and they get mentored even by some of the veterans, I mean it, it it's a it's a big signing for us. I mean yep. it's been a long time that, since we've had some some of these bigger names. Yeah, on exactly, our team, exactly. you know. I mean, yeah. So it's so that's very good. You know, Wiggins. Obviously, everybody has their thoughts about Wiggins. I kind of agree with most of them. He seems kind of nonchalant, like he's out there. He he enjoys playing basketball, but he doesn't have that drive. So, I mean, we've got those two as the cornerstones of our future, both young, and we're still a super young team. Um, but, of course, in typical Timberwolves fashion, we have to uh, make something look ugly and, and interesting with the whole Jimmy Butler thing. I mean, just that just angered me. I mean, <laughs> you he kind of see, he seemed like he wanted to come to us, and then he gets here and he just he's just an ass. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't want – you can tell he doesn't want a championship because no. of the teams he's asking for. Don't aren't even close to he wants money. He wants the money. He's yeah. greedy and he wants money. And I mean we'll give him money, but all of a sudden our money apparently isn't good enough for him. Another team's money is. So I've been seeing on Twitter, it seems uh once again, when this starts when we're we're recording this Monday night, when we air this on Wednesday morning, it's very possible Some Jimmy Butler's already been traded. Right. Um right now as we speak, uh the uh the Cavs are interested and in it sounds like the Miami Heat are putting the biggest full press full core press on him. I don't know okay. what they have for for talent around them. I know they have a couple of key players, but I don't know um I don't know what they're but but even Tibbs has said that he's not going to trade him just to trade him. He's not going to take a crap deal just to right. get rid of him. He's going to make sure he has something. Well, that that's the kind of stuff that I just don't understand. Like when when you can see that nucleus of a team that's emerging, and it's like why you wouldn't want to be why would you a not part be a of part that? of that? And and it reminds me a lot of kind of how the things went down when uh, I mean to date myself here, but uh, back Kevin Garnett, uh, Stefan Marbury, oh, Marbury. And, yeah, Marbury. And, and Marbury yeah. all of a sudden being like, well, I'm not the big kid around here, so I want to, you know, and it's yep. like, well, that yeah, just- but you do realize that you guys are like literally 
thunder and lightning on the court. Mm-hmm. Like you could, and, and so it's just when you see something like that come over money, it, the it's person- disheartening. Personality but, gets in the way. The greediness yeah. gets in the way. Um, you know, it's just it, it. It really is. It's too bad because finally the Timberwolves had this. But then again, in, in a way, I, I kind of don't mind pushing it. Our having our chance push back two three years because yeah. we still got to deal with Golden State and we still got to deal with now. Let's see what happens with the LeBron and the Lakers. And we got Houston and we got New and we got uh, uh, Oklahoma City who's still solid. So it's like. You know, our luck anyways. Our luck anyways. We would have had our best team ever's, and we'd be going up against the other best teams ever, (laughs) ever. Yeah. You know, with the Golden State. So it's yeah, it's it's a it's a headache, and and we'll talk uh, more Timberwolves throughout the season. In fact, if you are a a big Timberwolf fan and you are interested in coming on the show, I'm looking for uh, people who are tapped into the Wolves uh, more than I am. I'm a casual Wolves guy, and I'm looking for somebody who's tapped in to the Wolves like I am to the Vikings to come on um, um, once, twice a month and just kind of talk of Wolves updates and stuff like that. So if you do, please email me at k953sportsshow at gmail.com. That's k953sportsshow at gmail.com. Uh, but I, th- I think I'm just going to kind of – I think we're going to kind of leave it at there, Jeremy. We're going to kind of stop it right here because we've got the Stingers, uh, Mark and Ryan, coming up here and, and reviewing the 2018 season and looking into their 10th season next year. So 10 that, seasons already? Yeah, isn't that crazy? Next Holy. year's their 10th season. Yeah. yeah, it would be because it was the first year I started working here, and that yeah. was 2009. So yeah. Yep. Wow. Yep, yep. So it was uh, – so, yeah, so we got uh, that coming up here. So uh, f- uh, please listen. And once again, uh, people or Stinger fans that are listening for the first time, please hit the subscribe button and so you can listen to future podcasts. And once the Stingers come back around next year, I'll be having them on more often. So uh, here's the, uh, here is the interview that I recorded with Mark and Ryan a few days ago. Hey, I'm here today now with uh, the Stinger owners, Mark and Ryan, to talk about their season in review. Uh, first off, congrats on the ninth season of Stinger Baseball, guys. This summer was your best regular season record in the nine seasons that you guys have been around, and you had a 48-25 and with a .667 win percentage. What would you guys say was the biggest factor that made this season your best? You know, the goal uh, out of the gates was to win 41 games. We play a 72-game schedule in about a 77-day period, and the goal was to get to that 40 or 41-game mark. Um, we knew that if we could win 40 games, that that would mean that we were above 500, and uh, we would be close to our win totals of the past years. And so once we got to 41 wins, that was kind of the first goal. Um, and then after that, the next goal was to try to beat the franchise record of uh, 47 wins. Uh, which we ended up beating, and we ended up finishing with 48 uh, regular season wins, and then we finished with one postseason win for the 49th win for the year. So uh, the, the year was very similar. Obviously, we got an extra six wins and ended up winning the second half of the Northwoods League in the North Division. So it was very similar seasons other than the fact that you know we managed to get five or six extra Ws. Nice. Nice. Well, uh, you know, obviously you guys uh, made the playoffs. Um, you uh, won the first game playoff series because it's one game series and you lost the second one falling short of the first championship series you guys would have ever uh, made i i know they made this change recently um, within the last several years on the playoff format do you guys like the one game series two back-to-back one game series because to me any team any any baseball team can beat a team another team in one game you could be the worst team and the best team and you have a shot to win the game i don't feel like that really gets the best team out of it. What's your guys' thoughts on? Right. No, I, I agree with you. You know, the, the North of the League playoffs, I mean, you're, you're, uh, you go through a grind with 72 games in about 76 days. And so playoffs come around and uh, it, it's, you know, it's six six games. That's it. And uh, and part of that is is due to the fact that, the you know, our season's condensed and the, a lot of our players need to go back to school either that week or the week after. And so a lot of times – you know, you're losing some of the players because they got to go back to school, but every team's in the same boat. And so, you know, ideally you'd have a, a three-game series at least for each each uh, round of the playoffs. But, you know, under the uh, circumstances, you know, all of our players are primarily Division One college baseball players. they got to get back to school, and so you do a condensed uh, playoff version. And so, um, yeah, you play a one game, a sudden death, and yeah. winner, winner <laughs> goes, loser goes home. And, and um, you know, the old format used to be, where the uh, winner of the first half played the winner of the second half in a best of three. And so that was, uh, you know, back when there was less than 20 teams in the Northwoods League. And so the league owners said, boy, what a, 
what a shame you got 20 teams in the league and only four make it. Yeah. You know, can we somehow come up with another way to get, uh, you know, more teams in it, more teams down the stretch, you know, exciting to get into the playoffs. And, and so they expanded it, but then you get the one-game playoff. And so... Very, very, very MLB like adding their <laughs> adding their one game series just so they can add a couple extra. Correct, correct. So teams. it keeps everybody, uh, you know, keeps fan bases, every teams interested because there's you know obviously more playoff spots. Um, however, you know this year we would have liked the old format because we yeah. won the second half, yeah. but the <laughs> previous two years, hey, we liked the new format because we wouldn't have made the playoffs in the last yeah. two years because uh, we didn't win a half. But uh, yeah, this year's team was very special. Uh, coaching staff, I thought it did a fantastic job. You know, it's tough. You're managing uh, 72 games. you got a roster of 30 players, keeping everybody happy, keeping everybody playing time, you know, you know, trying to pitch guys, you know, uh, you know, enough innings but not too many innings. Mm-hmm. And so it's a real juggling act to keep it going and also play successful baseball to try to win games. Yeah. No, that's – yeah, no, I just, I just thought I – you know, the one-game series, and I understand the reasoning behind it. Just It's, it's just kind of difficult because, you know, you guys play all season and it's literally – just one game and you're in or out, and that that uh, I could see that being kind of aggravating, possibly for the uh, uh, for the players and whatnot. Um, well, I was uh, when I was looking through the batting stats and uh, some of the batting stats in preparation for tonight. A couple of names stood out to me. Probably, hopefully, I don't butcher some of these names too bad. But I got Tyler Reichenborn, mm-hmm. Daniela. Wow, nice. Nick Hernandez, Matt Ruddick, Jason Newman, and Eli Wilson seem to be among your top players this year in hitting. Do you guys, I've, I've never asked or heard of anything, do you guys do like a, a team awards or like a, a MVP of the season? Do you guys do anything? No, we did that uh, with the franchise in St. Cloud. We kind of give away the most valuable bat is what we call it because we were the St. Cloud River Bats. Ah. And we did an engraved baseball bat with the MVP of the team. We've never done that down here. And, um, you know, we discussed it early on the first season. But, you know, it's, it's so tough to do. I mean, you just rattle off five guys that could have really deserved it. Um you know, there's certain teams that do different, uh, the Hustle Award or MVP or, um, you know, a couple years ago we could have really done, you know, kind of a community leader type award. I think of Michael Suki who was with us and that summer he did 30 to 40 different volunteer community projects in the community. So, you know, there are certain awards that we could have given out to past players, but uh, we don't have a, like a specific award that we give to anybody. Okay. Well, well while I was looking at the stats, let me, uh, let me lay out a case for an MVP. Yeah. Jason Newman. So as the, uh, I think he'd be a good uh, possible MVP. MVP. Not only did he hit 289 and 142 at bats, he was also second on the team in RBIs. Um, but not only did he do it at the plate, but he did it at the mound too, pitching 31.2 innings, 53 strikeouts over those 31 innings, which is awesome. Um, second on the team um, with the strikeouts, and on ERA he only had a 1.98 and led the team with 10 saves. Those, I think that's MVP numbers because right. he did it on both sides. I tell you what, Bo. I mean, that, I mean, rarely do you have a guy that excels on you know both both sides like that. And so, I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, if there was ever MVP this year, I mean, normally you don't have a you know guy that's uh, leading your team in RBI and and uh, and also leading your team in saves. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, he's a he's a unique talent and uh, what a fun guy to be around. I mean. Uh, you know, team leader. I mean, he was. Uh, you know, he he was great. I mean, great guy to have in the clubhouse, and uh, we sure enjoyed having him uh, a part of the team this year. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, he'll be have an opportunity to come back. He'll be a senior um, at uh, Cal State in Northridge this year, and so uh, the Northridge League um, changed a rule last year where you can allow uh, senior pitchers, mm. and so you can allow you can have four up to four senior pitchers. Okay. And so that's exactly what he did. He was a pitcher, and then he was a DH. And so if you're classified as a pitcher in the North League, you can also DH. Okay. And so hypothetically, uh, he could come back uh, to be a pitcher and a DH, the same role he was in uh, this past summer, but uh, after his senior year. And the, the goal for him would be to you know, pitch very well and sign a free agent contract uh, You know, either during the North League season or after the North League season, uh, you know, similar to Nick Mears. Um, that uh, pitched for us this year that signed with the Pirates, you know, uh, okay. right after the season. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I was going to – that actually uh, kind of took uh, one of my questions. I say, so you don't think he's possibly uh, a draft possible for next year for, for, the, for MLB? Yeah. No, he, he could be. It, it all kind of comes down to what type of spring he's going to have. Um, you know, he's expressed interest in coming back. He wants to secure a spot back with us. He, without a doubt, could get drafted – uh, typically, the draft is you know the ninth to the eleventh of June. Our season starts uh, the Tuesday after Memorial Weekend, 
So odds are he'll be here, and then he could get drafted on June 9th and only be with us for nine or ten days and then sign with the pro team and be gone. Or if he doesn't uh, get drafted on the 9th or the 10th, then he continues to hopefully pitch well and potentially DH if we wanted him to, Yeah. Uh, even though I think everybody realizes that his upside is as a pitcher. And uh, then we'd have him for as long as he is. So that's the risk that you take by taking those guys is that they can sign as a free agent or get drafted at any point during the season. But for a guy like Newman who did what he did this past summer, we, we take that risk and bring him back. Yeah, no, I, I didn't know about the, the, the rule change and adding the seniors because I was actually going to be talking about that because I, I was mentioning on my next one, I was like with Nick, because Nick, one of the names I mentioned, Hernandez, he's – going to be a senior obviously he's hitting with the new role he can't come Correct. back but i did have jason i was saying well they're they're seniors and they're gonna not gonna be back so obviously ov- awesome if jason is because obviously i just relay relayed why he was so valuable to your guys' team this year uh the others how do you guys the other three that i did mention you know how do you look at um at the end of the season going into the next season how do you decide who you bring back the next year from the underclassmen do you i mean do you try to get as many back as possible or do you guys kind of weave out some of them that maybe didn't work out or how do you how do you guys yeah, go through that? It's a process that, that we go through every year and and we, we try to find out, you know, make sure we're all on the same page as to who we ask back. Uh, I would say probably three or four years ago we were more in the mode of trying to get back as many returners from year in and year out. And one year we actually returned probably eleven or twelve guys, close to thirteen, mm-hmm. almost half of the entire roster. And uh, now we still put emphasis on it, but not as much of an emphasis and uh, we kind of start putting together the team. We do ask back certain guys. So, you know, the guys like Matt Ruddick that you mentioned, a guy like Eli Wilson uh, will be asked back. Um, but, you know, there's a, a chance that a guy like Eli Wilson is going to be a junior at the University of Minnesota. His dad is Dan Wilson. I called the Gophers. I said, what are the chances Eli will be back as a stinger? And he said, you know what? You know dang well the Mariners are going to take him at some point in the Major League Draft. He's Dan Wilson's son. He was our cleanup hitter as a sophomore. He caught a ton for you guys in the summer. He's gotten way better since he was a freshman. He is a guy that should get drafted as a junior and signed. There's no reason why he should come back for his senior year at the University of Minnesota. And so we opt to not even necessarily pursue that any further because ultimately that could be a little bit of a waste of a roster spot if Wilson gets here and we lose him on June 9th. We just lost one of our key positions a catcher, yep. and now we're scrambling to try to find another catcher to fill in for Eli Wilson. So as much as we'd want Eli Wilson back, at some point you just move on it and start looking ahead for a new roster. And I suppose uh, something like that helps out with your guys' this relationship with coaches kind of around the U.S. that they're willing to be like, hey, this guy's good, and you guys know he's good. He's getting better. He, he knows he's going to be drafted, and we know he's going to be drafted. So that's nice that they kind of give you a heads up that they don't kind of – sell you up the road and not say anything to you about it. That's that's nice that they, they work with that. Yeah, and then there's certain guys like John Troutsdale that were with us this year. He's John's going to be a uh, uh, a junior, and we asked back John Troutsdale to come back. Great guy, utility type of guy, played first, played short, played second, played third, which did a really nice job. And they said, you know what, John has got some interest in maybe playing in the Cape Cod League, which is completely fine, but it, the Cape Cod League doesn't sign a lot of juniors because juniors are draft eligible. And they don't want to run that same risk of taking mm. juniors that might get drafted. So sense. he said, I'm not placing John Troutsdale with anybody else. Go ahead, f- fill out your roster. And if there's an opening in the spring, there's a chance Troutsdale would be available and you guys could take him. So we could be adding returners all the way along between now and the start of the 2019 season. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah, that's. I ca- I've kind of wondered a little more depth on that aspect of you guys signing players and stuff like that so that's that's a that's a cool inside look thank you for that uh let's i talked about batting let's kind of jump to the pitching side even though i talked a little pitching because jason did both but uh you know with there was a few standouts on there i saw jonathan uh mckinney uh he, he started nine games he was five and two 2.92 era um almost averaged a strikeout in inning and uh louis varland um, who's from maple wood minnesota here and uh, he pitched the most innings on the team he pitched 59.2 um, averaging a strikeout per inning, a respectable 4.07 ERA. Um, are there any names I missed out that were kind of standouts to you on the pitching staff? Uh, those those are the two that kind of popped out at me first. Right. I mentioned uh, you know Nick Mears uh, earlier. Uh, he was uh, you know outside of Jason Newman, he was their other closer. And and a lot of times in the North Northwoods League, you, you know you in Major League Baseball you got one closer. Well, in the Northwoods League, you you kind of need two back end guys. And so mm-hmm. 
Jason Newman was one of them, and uh, Nick Mears was our other guy. And uh, and Nick Mears, uh, you know, he, he pitched for us uh, last summer, and uh, and then um, you know obviously joined us this year. But boy, he had an unbelievable summer uh, for the Stingers. I mean, he pitched, uh, you know, was our back end guy, had a ton of strikeouts, and that playoff game. Uh, basically, he was the MVP of that uh, playoff game against Mankato. He came in in relief. We were down, and uh, he struck out. What was it? Uh, nine nine batters. Yeah, he struck out nine in uh, in three innings. I mean, Oof. can't get much better than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, you can't. <laughs> and uh, and you know, we're we're extremely excited for him uh, after the season. Uh, there was uh, four or five major league teams that offered him a uh, you know contract. Awesome. And uh, he had, ended up uh, signing a contract with the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates organization. And uh, literally, he, after the season, flew out to California, where he was from, uh, signed the contract, got a haircut, flew to uh, Florida, where uh, where Pittsburgh Pirates, uh, the kind of their uh, um, you know spring training is, yep. did a workout there. Then they sent him to West Virginia to their short season A ball, and had three appearances, and uh, you know had six strikeouts, Oof, uh, nice. no runs, and no ERA, and and so now he'll go back to their program there this spring, and then they'll play some somewhere in minor league baseball, and so hopefully. He keeps progressing and uh, you know gets in the big leagues one day. Nice, yeah. I was gonna say I was just looking at his stats here quick. Yeah, he had 19 and a third innings, 29 strikeouts, and that's I'm, I'm assuming these are regular season stats that I'm looking at. Correct. Yeah. Um, one and one, 1.39 ERA. So yeah, that was yeah. No, I agree. That's a very solid season um, on his side. Uh, so obviously it's the off season. Um, or actually, is there anything else you guys want to kind of touch on on the regular season at all? No, it was just it was. Uh it was a, it was a very great it was a great year and um, Duluth ended up going on beyond uh, the game here in Wilmer and, and facing Fond du Lac Wisconsin. It was the second year that that franchise had been in the Northwoods League. Mm. So uh, hats off to Fond du Lac to win the league championship, their second year <laughs> in the league. And uh, oddly enough, a couple years ago, Lakeshore Chinooks ended up winning it. I think in their second or third year. So oh. it just tells you every year there's so much parity in the Northwoods League that it doesn't really matter how long you've been around. It's a matter of putting together a good squad. But then staying healthy and really getting hot at the right time. So Fond du Lac wins forty three games in the entire season. We win forty nine. Doesn't matter. We win six more games, but they win them at the right times, and they beat Duluth in a game three of the division championship, and they celebrate uh, a Northwoods League championship in their second season. So uh, pretty cool for them to be able to experience that early on in their uh, franchise. Well, you talk about the the one game playoff. Uh, they their, their first round of the playoffs. They played Madison. Madison had the number one overall seed in the entire I, Northwoods I League. I did see that, and I think they beat them by ten plus runs yeah. in that first game. And so, you just say, hey, you know what? If they played a three game series, they might they might have lost the next two to Madison, and Madison moves yeah. on. But in the nature of the Northwoods League playoffs, it's yeah. one game and and you're done. So uh, you know, it, so Madison here they are, number one seed out first round. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know that. I, I did see that because when after you guys won, I was like, I was like, oh, who are they playing for the next one game playoff? And I saw that, and and I knew Madison was the one seed going in. I was like, oh, that was. <laughs> I didn't expect to see that that score. Right. Exactly. And uh, when you you mentioned there isn't really par- there's a lot of parity in the league, N- not really for us at the Stingers because uh, I believe I was talking with you, Mark, over um, at one of the games that we sponsored that you said that uh, we have the combined. Since you guys of the nine seasons, we have the the Stingers have the best regular season record overall. Since right. yeah, since it's, that. so it's, that's, uh, that, that's awesome. It's no, it's pretty cool. I mean, it, and hats off to the, the coaching staff and and Ryan does a great great job of putting together the, these rosters and dealing with the coaches and and so I mean and the players. Um, but but it, and and a lot it has a lot to do with the the fan base and uh, and the pride that uh, you know Wilmer has for the Stingers and the home atmosphere that we had. I mean, we had. An unbelievable home record here, and that's you know that's a tribute to, you know, just the atmosphere that these guys play in. They look forward to playing at uh, at the Beehive and the fan support. But yeah, you look back at it since the Stingers started uh, back in uh, 2010 was their first first year. Uh, no other team in the Northwoods League has won more games uh, than the Stingers uh, since since we started. Nice. Uh, yeah. However, we're uh, I always have to throw this. Yeah. We're, all, we're three and eight in the playoffs. Yeah. So hey, you know. <laughs> There's, a, there's always room for improvement, yeah, right? Yeah, very, very, very Vikings-esque, which, of course, we'll touch base later. But yeah, just, just can't get there and get over the hump. Um, yeah, no, that is that is nice. And, and like you mentioned, the fans, I know that we that Wilmer is – is Wilmer the smallest or one of the smallest? Yeah, we, we've done that comparison. And uh, if you look at, you know, a 30-mile radius, you look at the county, and uh, the city limits of Wilmer are 
slightly larger than Wisconsin Rapids. But if you take a 30-mile radius of Wilmer and a 30-mile radius of Wisconsin Rapids, there's actually more people in a 30-mile radius in Wisconsin Rapids than there is uh, here in Wilmer. And so I guess we call ourselves the smallest franchise of the 20. Wisconsin Rapids very close to being the second smallest. And then from there, I, I would say probably the next smallest from that point on is it might be somewhere in the neighborhood of a Fond du Lac uh, or a Mankato or a Wausau that's uh, 50 to 60 to 70, and then you go up from there. So there's a lot of larger markets outside of Wilmer that are in the Northwoods League. Yeah, and and what I was getting at too, though, is that even though you guys are the smallest market, uh, we, we, we're we not the smallest, uh, the fan base. The fan base has been great for the nine years, and I knew it would be a success when you guys were coming to town. I knew we'd you'd have the backing of the town, uh, but you guys usually average probably about, you know, out of the 20 teams, I'd say probably the mid-teens. Yeah, yeah. I think in in uh, attendance yeah, and, wise, and, and, and that's, that just shows to the level. Well, of one one could say that if the league was, you know, one hundred percent healthy, that we would have the smallest attendance with the smallest franchise. But uh, there's a lot of teams that are drawing that eight hundred to a twelve hundred a night, and then some that are fourteen and fifteen hundred. So majority of the teams draw a thousand to fifteen hundred that fall within the league, and uh, there's a few teams that draw less than us. Um, but and there's as the team has added bigger markets like Kalamazoo and Bismarck, we have slid a little bit down the line in terms of <laughs> attendance with the other teams. Yeah, but that's okay. Uh, we have been able to maintain the fan base from 2010 till today, and uh, one year we might be up 20 fans, or the next year down 20 fans, but really consistently over a thousand for the nine past seasons. Nice, nice. Well, that. Well, that kind of gets me uh, to kind of the next question. Uh, your guys' off season is obviously right now. What are you guys currently working on um, leading up into next year's season? Yeah, I mean, right now, I mean, you, you take a breather after the after the season, and uh, you know, go through all the the financials and make sure all the bills are paid, and uh, you know, and then we try to close the books on on 2018, and then we start recruiting the team uh, for next year. And so, one of the first things we do is is we. You know, we we seek back, uh, try to get the contracts uh, signed from the three coaches that we had last year, mm-hmm. and so we pursue those guys and say, hey, we'd love to have you back. Let's try to you know figure out a uh, contract for the coaches, and then uh, hopefully that works. And then with their help, uh, we're securing the uh, roster for next year. And so it's crazy, like the ro- you know our roster is being put together right now um, for twenty you know twenty nineteen, and so um, so a lot of that takes place, and then. Usually around October 1, uh, we start working on our schedule. The league gets our schedule out right around in November, and then we start putting together uh, you know, partnerships with businesses and, and promotions. And uh, this time of year, too, is we're researching different things. Like um, you know, the last week of September, Ryan and I and our staff will go down to uh, Des Moines for the uh, Minor League Baseball Promotional Seminar. Mm. And so it's three days. You know, Everyone has their trade shows in their industry. Well, this is kind of our trade show for baseball. Oh, cool. And so... Uh, there's over 100 minor league teams represented there, share ideas, best practices, and try to come up with some ideas and, and try to make your organization better with some fun promotions, new things at the ballpark. And so hopefully we'll have some fun ideas there to implement uh, for 2019. Yeah, I was going to say, I was, that was going to be one of the uh, things I was going to mention, obviously, being your 10th season next year. I'm going to say what kind of uh, cool, fun promotions giveaways i'm assuming you guys are going to be working a little extra hard on that being at your 10th season and everything yeah no it'll be fun uh this is like mark mentioned the month of september uh, we kind of wrap up the year and then we come back from that promotional seminar at the end of september and in october we spend two days of putting together all the notes and quite honestly we highlight 10 to 15 things that we want to do for the upcoming season everything from celebrating the 10th anniversary we've discussed uh if we were able to pull it off be cool to do an alumni type of night mm. and do it on the weekend and invite back players from yeah, the last cool. nine seasons. And boy, wouldn't it be cool to get you know between forty and sixty or sixty and eighty former players back that would be with Wilmer and some of them now have families. Some have gone on to play professional baseball and are now into their careers. Some are the ones that wouldn't be able to join us are the ones that are con- that are still playing. But wouldn't it be fun to bring back some of those names at the ballpark uh, for kind of an alumni night uh, at the stadium? So that's one of the ideas. But uh, to be able to kind of look at, you know, what does the what do the promotions look like next year? In some way, we'll keep, but we'll also uh, do some new ones as well. Nice, nice. So, so obviously, also in the off season, you guys are going to be working on uh, season tickets and stuff like that. What's 
uh, what are you guys working on with that right now, or how can people get Yeah, no, uh, we just haven't. sent out the letters for the renewals, and, and every year um, we're always looking for, uh, you know, new fans. And so uh, as we prepare for uh, the 10th season, season tickets are always a inexpensive way to be able – you know, the tickets are discounted as you buy them as a package, as a season ticket in any kind of sports, and uh, always great gifts for – birthdays, uh, Christmas gifts, and so every year we try to build that season ticket holder base, and uh, this is the time of the year where people are thinking about what they can do for uh, somebody within their family. So the letters went out for the renewals, but now people can call into our office and let us know if they're interested, and we have different tickets that are option, you know, whether it's the upper level or the lower level at the ballpark, that they'll be able to uh, be able to pick their seats yet before the snow flies out at the ballpark and then in preparation for uh, next summer. Nice, nice. Well, you guys obviously keep busy year round, so it's a, it's not just a seasonal thing that the, the people realize. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people realize what you guys do in the off season, how much work you. Well, number one question: out. What do you do in the off season? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. every single time you run into somebody, I mean, it's crazy. Uh, I mean, it, literally just about every single day. Yeah. I mean, you know, what do you do in the off season? You know, and like, well, we don't. You know, we do a little bit in September, but then October till June, it it literally is creating partnerships uh, with businesses and visiting with people and reviewing what the partnership might have looked like last year and really starting to kind of climb that mountain to fill the ballpark again for next summer. Nice, nice. So uh, appreciate uh, appreciate you guys help uh, coming in and doing the uh, Stinger Review on the season. Uh, for the usual listeners who have listened in the past, uh, we've been doing a kind of a common theme that I'm doing all season long for football season. Uh, it started uh, with me, just me and the announcers, and every new person that comes in, I ask them for their Mount Rushmore of Vikings players. And then I think at the end of the season, we'll do, I have to come, I'm, I'm already thinking of some kind of a promotion to try to maybe some kind of a voting on it and maybe nailing it down to like four people after everybody has gone through and told me throughout the season. So even though you guys are in here talking baseball, it's football season, uh, let's let's talk a quick few minutes about uh about the Vikings, um, go ahead. Uh, why don't you go ahead and start, uh, Ryan? Okay, so for the four uh, Mount Rushmore Minnesota Vikings, I put together my notes, and uh, <laughs> I've already changed one of them yeah. in this process, <laughs> as Sound we like were thinking. Dad. And so, um, <laughs> you know, first when you ask this, I think of the purple people eaters and, and the success that the Vikings had, but quite honestly, I'm probably too young. You know, I, I never did see Fran Tarkenton play. And then I think about the fun guys that we watched who – were fun to watch but didn't have a great career like Tommy Kramer. And uh, then I think about the, the players that I was really rooting for as a kid. So I have uh, kind of one from the past and then as we kind of go from generation to generation. So the four that I put down uh, was Fran Tarkenton, even though uh, I, had, I didn't see him play, but obviously we know what impact he made with the Minnesota Vikings. Yep. And then I, I did have down Sammy White, but I'm not going to go with Sammy White. I'm going to go with uh, Joey Browner uh, because Joey was a guy that – Played for the Vikings when I was a kid, and when you played football in the backyard, you wanted to you know, hit guys like Joey Browner did uh, when you were wearing your yeah. Riddell uh, Vikings helmet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I have another defensive guy, Keith Millard, who was a fun guy to watch as a defensive lineman. And then one that's a little bit more current, but yet you know, uh, probably 10 to 15 years ago, by the name of Chris Carter. So yes. the four that I went with were Fran Targenton, Joey Browner, Keith Millard and Chris Carter are the four. Nice, though. That's a that's a solid four. Uh, the Joey Browner, you're the second person to say that. Um, for people who haven't heard, if you want to listen back to our first regular episode, uh, my my dad picked Joey Browner and kind of surprised me. I <laughs> he I was I he was kind of like oh, I loved him and just the way he hit and and it's like you know for somebody who has you know you talked you know none of us saw the purple people players none of us saw the Super Bowl teams really and and so but my dad did and to pick Joey Brown there it surprised me uh but yeah he he came in he had four different Mount Rushmores <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't decide yeah. yeah so he so he finally broke it down to one uh just in time for that but Joey Browner was one of them on there uh Keith Millard his first one his first appearance uh we mentioned him on uh, on the last podcast uh, with uh, Packer fan, he even brought him up. Kind of, it's like, yeah, I even thought about Menard, and right. and so did uh, another guy. So that was, and of course, Carter is to me arguably the best wide receiver of all time. You know, everybody says Rice because of what he did with who he did it with, but that's that's the key thing. He did it with arguably two of the best all time quarterbacks, and right. where Carter was, you know, in the '90s, it was a new starting quarterback pretty much every year for Denny Green. So I mean, he was. Pitching with some over the hill guy or you know 
with the, some overhill guys and stuff like that. But yeah, no, I like that's a good yeah. that's a good four. I like it. Mark, go ahead and <laughs> let's hear yeah, your I four. Got, I got four uh, di- completely different players, so that's why that's a pretty good exercise. Here, that's what know? that's what I love about <laughs> this. That's what I love about this this question. It's I've we haven't had a same one yet, and I don't expect one. Maybe uh-huh. maybe we'll get one, but. Right. Well, I, I I did think of Joey Browner because I same with with Vaz. I you know, I can echo his statements playing in the backyard and clotheslining guys like Joey Browner would, <laughs> yeah. uh, and just saying you know running around with number forty seven out there. Yeah, but uh, but I didn't pick him. Um, I went with more of you know my favorite players. Not you know not classic, just favorite players. And so when you asked me this, I said, well, the first one is is Randy Moss. I mean, I, you know he's. I mean, he's a highlight reel when you yeah, can you can watch him on uh, you know you see YouTube uh, highlight reels of Randy Moss and you're just like I can't believe that that you know he was that good and and they and and with him joining the Hall of Fame this year there those videos were everywhere correct and yeah. I just I mean I even though I saw the same video I probably saw the same video a dozen times but it's just like oh man you forget some of these things right. cause, and it's just oh yeah so yeah I I agree yeah. with that and then uh, the next next guy this will be a surprise I'm sure but I. He's a current Viking. I just love the way he plays. But Eric Kendricks hmm. uh, is my favorite player on the Vikings right now. I just uh, I love the way he plays. He's a little bit undersized, so he's got a little chip on his shoulder. But uh, he he plays the game uh, I think the right way, and it's pretty fun to watch. Yeah, I, I agree. He's uh, he's a lot of fun. And then uh, and then I got to throw it back to a couple of old school guys. Uh, John Randall uh, would be my other uh, Mount Rushmore. And then the last one is uh, Scott Studwell. Uh, oh, Scott. Was another guy in the nice. in the backyard where. You know, got the double nickels on the fifty-five, just like Barry yeah, running yeah. around the backyard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but those are my four guys. We got Moss, we got John Randall, Eric Kendricks, and Scott Studwell. Nice, yeah. That's the first appearance by Scott Studwell. Um, honorable mention by my dad. I think he was on one of the other three. <laughs> yeah, the three boards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, that is a, that is an awesome. That is a good one too. I like I like the uh, the flair of the, the current player with Kendricks, and I I do like Kendricks. He's uh, like you said, he's a little undersized, but he's got the speed. He's uh, you know, I, I I like watching when he covers a tight end or sometimes even a slower wide receiver thirty yards down the field, and he's right on their heels. So I, yeah, he's got. I'm glad we signed him long term because he's got a bright future uh, with the Vikings. And by the end of the season, by the end of his career, if he sticks around here, you never know. He might be. Uh, put in those conversations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For for more than just being a a, a favorite player of yours, he might. (laughs) So that's, and that's what I like too about uh, the Mount Rushmore aspect is everybody has a different way to come up with theirs. Uh, Al Sheldon here, he had met a couple of them. He went to, he went to school with one and and broadcasting, uh, Carl Eller. So he's like, oh, you know, I actually talked to him a few times. So that's why he's on there. And uh, so, yeah, that's, it's like, it's, like I said, it's such a variety of options and, and I'll be surprised if there's ever a four-person one that's going to be repeated throughout the season. Right. It'll be interesting to check that. But thank you guys for uh, for coming in and, and helping me uh, kind of review the Stingers and also uh, putting in your two cents on the Mount Rushmore. I appreciate that. Uh, just a reminder for uh, the people listening, if you uh, kind of like what you hear and you want to hear, hear more of my podcasts that come out every Wednesday, please please hit the subscribe button. And uh, right next to it, there's a kind of a bell. You click that, and it'll actually uh, come up on your phone when I release them each week. Just kind of a reminder also. So uh, please uh, continue checking those out. Uh, thanks, guys, again for coming in. Hey, no problem. Thanks, yeah, Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. And I look forward uh, to the 10th uh, season and, and the future of the Wilmer Stingers. Uh, it's, I'm with you guys at the helm, I have, I have all the confidence that it's, still, it's going to be bright. Yeah, who knows? We, there's <laughs> not nine in the books, and uh, hopefully there's nine more ahead. You know? There we go. Perfect, perfect. Hey, thanks, guys, for everything again. Thank you. Thank you.